and I'm welcome to the August virtual book party. My name is Tanya and I'm a children's librarian at Arapaho Library District and we are going to go in alphabetical order for introductions. So Allison, you're muted though. <laughs> Off to a good start. <laughs> My name is Allison Cochran and I'm an adult advisory librarian with the district. Chuck. I'm Charles, uh, and I'm one of the reference librarians around Arapahoe Library District. I believe I'm next. I'm Julia. I'm a library specialist at Castlewood Library. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie, and I work on the web team. My name's Lauren Reed, and I'm one of the teen services librarians for the district. Thanks, everyone. Um, so the way this works is everybody will get about a minute um, to talk about the book. Again, you don't have to, or about each book. Um, again, you don't have to write down titles or authors. I will send the list out um, when we are done. Did I forget anything, Allison, or are you ready to book talk? Ready. All right, here we go. Okay, this is Wiley Cash's When Ghosts Come Home. This is a new book. It's coming out September 21st, but we do already have it on order. It's set in North Carolina in 1984, and it's so atmospheric of that time and place. Winston is a small town sheriff who wakes up to the sound of a plane crash. And when he goes to investigate, he finds the plane is empty. There's no one in the pilot seat. So who crashed this small plane? Um, but then they find a body nearby, but the body has not, did not die from a plane crash. They've been shot. So who was the pilot? Who is this dead body that's here? He's trying to investigate all this while his town is dealing with a lot of racial and economic divides. Um, and he's got family problems to deal with. It's a perfect blend of literary fiction, a character driven story and a thriller. My first book is Your Book by Seth Rogen. This is a biography. Your book traces the roots of Seth Rogen's comedic career. From stand up at a lesbian nightclub when he was 13 and supported by his parents and grandparents, and on to his controversial release and uh, publicity behind the movie The Interview about North Korea and their supreme leader, Kim Jong un. You get a lot of background on how Rogen and his friend and writing companion, Evan Goldberg, have gotten their material over the years. Warning, there is a lot of drug use in this book. Okay, I'm gonna talk about Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. So Reid brings us another heartfelt, engaging and character-driven book in Malibu Rising. She even gives us a fun little nod to some of her seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo characters in this one. Malibu Rising focuses on the epic end of summer beach party thrown by the famous Reba siblings. There's Nina, a model, surfer, and reluctant celebrity, brothers Jay and Hud, who have fame of their own via surfing and photography. Then there's their little sister Kit, who is still learning who she is and what she wants to do with her life. Part of the Reba kids' fame also comes from their dad, Mick Reba, a legendary singer with decades of success. Over the course of the evening, the party will bring a multitude of people together and sparks of all kinds will fly. This story touches on all the messes families make and how to make the most of the hand you've been dealt. If you want a story that tugs on the heartstrings, give you all the family drama, and still leaves you feeling hopeful, definitely pick this one up. That's Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. My first book is Shipped by Angie Hockman, and I'm really into enemies to lovers romances these days, and this book gave me major summer vibes, even though I know it's August, school is starting, whatever. If you're looking for a little bit of summer, I recommend this book. In this novel, you meet two marketing professionals who are up for the same job. They work for a cruise line and their boss decides, I'm going to send you both on this cruise so you can see how the cruise line works. And whichever of you writes the best marketing proposal to kind of highlight, you know, why you should go on a cruise at the Galapagos Islands, you're going to get the promotion. Um, of course, sparks are going to fly when you're trapped on a cruise ship, you know, traveling around this beautiful ocean. So um, what I really liked about this book is the banter, the sexual tension, and of course, how the heroine has her own prideful, preconceived notions about this guy. And then that very sweet moment of realization when you go, hmm, maybe he isn't so terrible after all. Awesome. So... Honey and Issues uh, Guide to Fake Dating is, I would say, for 12 years up, 
and up um, or sixth grade. And it's a really good romance that's set in Dublin and Hanny and Issue, they really don't have too much in common. They're the only two brown students in their class and they both speak um, Bengali at home. Um, but other than that, they're very different. Hanny is very popular. Issue wants to become the head girl at her school and is really having a hard time because she isn't as popular and you kind of need that, that vote. Uh, Hanny comes out to her friends as bisexual and they question her. Um, I will say there is a bit of bullying in this um, as, a, as a content warning, um, but she's only dated guys, so her, her friends push back, and that's when she just blurts out that she's dating Issue. Uh, and so she goes and talks to her to tell her, obviously, before she finds out from someone else. Um, and that's when they've decided that uh, they can do this fake dating if she can work on, if Hanny will help her become popular, Issue become popular. And so it's this story of kind of learning from each other, kind of figuring out what that looks like um, to make her popular for the head girl. I really like the friendships, again, content warning a little bit with uh, the bullying and some racism, but it's, it's a really sweet story. So that's Honey and Issue's Guide to Fake Dating. Okay, this is The Poison Squad by Deborah Bloom. It's nonfiction. It came out a couple of years ago, but we just did it at one of the library book clubs and there was just such great discussion. It's a biography, primarily a biography, of Dr. Harvey Washington Wiley, who led efforts to make food safer in the early 1900s. There are some horrifying stories in the book about they don't know how many children in New York City died because they put formaldehyde in the food, to, in, the, in milk to preserve it about the conditions in the meat packing plants and then how little actual real food was in some of the food in particular there's a whole chapter on whiskey most of the whiskey was actually ethyl alcohol with brown food coloring in it even from whiskey producers they, they would just blend it in um, they just did a lot of negotiating and all and eventually it leads to the passage of the 1906 um, food Safety Act. And we should be so grateful that that passed, even though we continue to have some issues today with what's in our food and stuff. But um, it was so fascinating to read this because the whole thing was about the war between politics and science, between what's best for people and business interest. And it just really might have had a few correlations to our own time. My next book is Dessert Person by Claire Savitz. Uh, this is a nonfiction. Uh, Savitz is formerly a Bon Appetit and their test kitchen web team, and now works as a freelancer for New York Times Cooking. What I love about this baking book is that Savitz provides a great chart of how challenging a recipe is and how long it takes to make. And I'll give you a quick try and, so you get to see kind of how, th how long things will take by how challenging they are. Um, <clears throat> A wide range of dessert recipes at, that are both sweet and savory. Examples are blueberry slab pie, almond carrot cake, and creamy greens pie with baked eggs. If you like Great British Bake Off, this is a great book with interesting new takes on classic baked dishes. Okay, next book I'm going to talk about is a memoir called My Remarkable Journey by Katherine Johnson. When asked what she thought about the movie Hidden Figures, inspired by her story, Katherine Johnson praised the film, but said they aired in two ways. The first was the timeline of when she wore glasses, and the second was making her appear anxious at the first moon launch because, quote, she knew her numbers were right. I loved that quote. <laughs> this is the memoir of Katherine Johnson, the mathematician for NASA's first flights. Um, and the first, uh, oh, sorry, I lost my place. Um, the personal narrative goes from her time as a prodigy in West Virginia and to one of NASA's human computers. If you've seen the movie, you're probably familiar with the term. Johnson also sheds light on the time of intense racial history she and her peers continually faced and the amazing educators that nurtured her and like-minded dreamers to become trailblazers in their fields. Johnson's story is an incredible ode to tight-knit communities, the power of learning, and the confidence that an education can bring. I personally love this, this, this description of how her story is centered around the basic tenets of her life. No one is better than you, education is paramount, and asking questions can break barriers. I think that says it all. That is My Remarkable Journey by Katherine Johnson. 
All right, the next book I'm going to talk about is Survive the Night by Riley Sager. And if you're unfamiliar with Riley Sager, um, this author writes a lot of kind of domestic thrillers. They're kind of twisted. They're really compelling. They're kind of like these books that you just can't put down because you're like, is the world really, really this bad? Um, so what I love about this one is the setting. And um, it totally blew me away because the setting of this book takes place almost entirely inside a car. So imagine it's the 1990s, you're in college, you don't have a car, you're desperate to get home. So you go to the local rideshare board, you meet a guy and he's like, well, I'll drive you home. So you're trapped in this car with a man that you've never met. So what do you think is going to happen? Um, is the man trustworthy? Is he honest? Why is he saying these kind of weird things that are starting to unsettle you are you overreacting so what it does is it really heightens the suspense i just kind of gave myself shivers thinking about it um so you might not think that a novel about two strangers trapped in a car is going to be all that interesting but you do not see the twist coming i did not guess the twist on this one at all so i highly recommend it thing me forgotten is i would say for eighth grade and up and it is amazing gender flipped retelling of Phantom of the Opera. I super enjoyed it because there's also a bit of fantasy mixed in as well. And Isda is cast into a well at birth. Her mom um, tries to get rid of her because she possesses this ability that is illegal. She can manipulate memories when people sing. And the owner of an opera house finds her and takes her in and kind of you know, is raising her and is teaching her about the opera house, but keeping her in secret. And as she gets older, she realizes what she can do. And that's when they make this agreement that if she helps with sale prices by quote, correcting memories, making the opera the best it can be, um, then she is able to stay there and he won't turn her in. And there's this guy who starts working there as a custodian and he has an amazing voice and she is drawn in by his memories when he sings she's never heard anything like it and that's because these memories are alluding to a life that she could have outside the opera house and so she's very curious what is this is this really possible and so it's her story of kind of figuring out what to do um, and and how innocent is the opera owner and all these things so it's fan fantastic so that's singing forgotten So We Are the Brennans by Tracy Lang. This just was published last week. And if you like family drama, this is the book for you because the Brennans have family drama to spare. They're a large Irish American family in New York. And one daughter has left the immediate family circle and gone to California to try to establish a somewhat independent life. But she's involved in a drunk driving incident and returns home to try to rebuild her life and to help her family's somewhat failing pub business. But there's a lot of competition going on at the pub and a lot of um, financial wheeling and dealings, high school mistakes that still come back to haunt the characters. There's people keeping too many secrets and there's some other people not keeping things that should have been secret. You should just take it all in and sit back and enjoy the fireworks in this family. My next book is Adventurer's Son by Roman Dial. This is nonfiction as well. Dial traces his life of adventure while working as a research biologist and mathematician, first at Stanford University and later at Alaska Pacific University in Anchorage. Dial raises his son, Cody, and daughter, Jazz, while traveling the world from Borneo to Australia, Central America to Alaska. Frequently, the family can be found pack rafting, hiking, camping, and adventure racing. When Cody hits his late 20s and has a difficult year and suddenly goes missing in the jungles of Costa Rica, Roman goes in search of his son. Followed, <clears throat> followed the dial's hardship to bring his son back home to Alaska. Okay, I'm gonna talk about Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead next. At 600 pages, Great Circle is quite a journey. This is the story of Marion Graves, a female aviator who finds her fame in circumnavigating the globe by flying over the North and South Poles. This read dives into the history of Marion and her brother, Jamie, from being rescued off a sinking ship to growing up with their uncle, from Marion disguising herself as a boy so she could find work, to her ending up in a difficult marriage that ultimately helped her learn to fly. 
This book also parallels Marion's story with a modern day actress, Hadley, who is playing Marion in an upcoming film. The dual narrative, jumping through time, added a good pace to this story, especially because there's pieces of the past still to be uncovered, and I really liked that part. Overall, I really appreciate this book for Shipstead's incredible writing, the stunning descriptions around Marion's passion for aviation and her struggles as a female. This would make an excellent book club pick because it could prompt some great discussion about Marion's passion, career, and struggles in the culture's limited view of femininity. For the last 100 or so pages of this book, I couldn't put it down. That is The Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead. All right, my next book is In the Quick by Kate Hope Day. And um, I'm not typically a science fiction reader, but I picked this up because of the billionaire space race. It seemed very timely to kind of read about what's happening in space. Um, and it held my attention. So imagine in a not too distant future, there is a tween girl named June. When she um, is growing up, there's this spaceship that goes missing, like a big spaceship. And she becomes obsessed with the mystery of what happened to the spaceship. Why did it go missing? How can something like a spaceship go missing? How many millions of dollars were put into the spaceship and it just disappears? Why aren't people more concerned with this missing spaceship? And what nefarious things are maybe happening out there that she should know about? So as she grows up, she never forgets this missing spaceship and she grows up to become this brilliant young astronaut and she discovers evidence that the spaceship and its crew are possibly still alive and she becomes hell-bent on finding the spaceship. Uh, I've seen some reviewers call it a Jane Eyre in space, if that also piques your interest. So uh, a great science fiction female-centric novel to try. The Shape of Thunder, I would say, is for sixth grade and up. Definitely needs to have a conversation with it, though. I start with a content warning that it is about characters that are working through a school shooting experience. Uh, Cora and Quinn have been best friends for as long as they can remember. Both in the last year, they haven't been talking at all. They're both working through some really difficult grief. Um, Cora has lost her sister in a school shooting, and Quinn is trying to process what her brother has done. Uh, and they both are, like I said, working through that grief, so they aren't talking. That's when Quinn, uh, around the year mark, has decided she really wants to try to patch things and, and talk to uh, Cora again. And she puts a box on, on her front porch for her 12th birthday. And one thing that Cora loves is kind of time travel and trying to figure out how to do that. And that's, Quinn believes she's found enough evidence through different articles, she's done a lot of research, that there might be a wormhole in the fabric of the universe that they can alter the time through. And it's not a traditional way. They think they can do it pretty easily. Um, and so this starts the conversation again. Could we, could they find this wormhole and be able to change time and figure out what happened um, and go back? So again, several tough topics, but the friendships new and old are fantastic in this one. And I really enjoyed The Shape of Thunder. Okay, this is Once There Were Wolves by Charlotte McConaughey. She's the author of Migrations, which was kind of a hit a couple of two years ago. And this is another novel that focuses on climate change and humans' impact on animal life. Inti is a biologist who travels to Scotland to help reintroduce wolves to the highlands. There's a huge overpopulation of deer in the highlands, and it's led to the deforestation of much of the land. And so the wolves are needed to try to control the deer population. But obviously, the the farmers and the ranchers are worried that the wolf, wolf are gonna kill all their sheep. And will, will Inti do just about anything to protect her sheep? There's a lot of violence in the book against people and animals, but it's sort of worth the pain of that for beautiful writing, lush descriptions of Scotland, and really deep character development. You should try the audiobook narrated by Saskia Marlfeld. She is amazing in it. That's once there were wolves. My next book is The Last Call by Elon Green. This is also nonfiction, also kind of a hard read, but um, I promise I'll end on a good note. This is for true crime lovers. Follow along as a decades long manhunt for the person who is killing gay men from piano bars in the New York region. Please try to unfold the smallest of details that may lead to an arrest. The Last Call Killer terrorized the gay communities in the 1980s and 1990s when the AIDS 
epidemic was ravaging the gay community and murder rates in New York City were sky high. This book is a memoir to the men we lost to the last call killer. The Seven Days in June by Tia Williams is a new romance fiction filled with honest humor, heartfelt characters, and several steamy moments. So if you like that, you'll probably like this. This book centers on Brooklynite Eva Mercy, who is a single mom and best-selling erotica writer. She is not only being pressured to write the next installment of her hit vampire series, Cursed, but is also having her painful past showing up in her present. Shane Hall is a literary author famous for his reclusive behavior, and when he shows up, in New York, his traumatic past with Eva comes to the surface. Their teenage love story that spanned a crazy and impactful week didn't end as they both secretly wrote to each other in their books ever since. Now in the middle of a Brooklyn summer, Eva and Shane reconnect and they'll have to discover what the future holds for them. This is not just a light rom-com, I will tell y'all. Uh, there is poignant commentary on trauma, addictions, abandonment, black life, and modern mother motherhood. Uh, especially in New York City specifically. William's commentary on Eva's invisible disability of life disrupting migraines is so valuable and shows how hard it is to receive help for invisible illnesses. She also notes a, a thanks to her um, migraine doctor and her acknowledgments. So I thought that was uh, just telling of how impactful it is to her. This is an excellent read for those wanting some steamy romance, tough topics, humorous commentary, and a look into the glam life of black writers in New York City. That's seven days in June. My next novel is Palace of the Drowned by Christine Mangan. And you may remember her novel Tangerine, which was um, kind of big in the literary circles, like literary thrillers a couple of years ago. Um, and I love this one because I love a good, moody, atmospheric, melancholic kind of thriller read. So this novel is about a novelist who basically has self-exiled herself to Venice in 1966 after an unnamed and some kind of unfortunate, unsavory incident that basically has kind of wrecked her career and she's not really sure what to do. So she's going to Venice. Um, she's kind of debating her worth as a person, as a novelist, what does this mean? And while she's there, a young woman kind of mysteriously appears in Venice and claims a personal connection to the novelist. But the thing is, the novelist doesn't quite believe that they have this personal connection. She's not quite sure if they know each other. So it kind of becomes this kind of twisty, kind of mess game of who's right, do they actually know each other, what's happening, and why would this young woman want to speak to this novelist? And what's the palace of the drowned mean? You'll have to read it to find out. The companion I'd say is for seventh grade and up, and it's suspense through and through. Uh, Margot has been through a lot. She is, she was in a, an accident with her family, and she's the only one that survived. And now, as you can imagine, she is trying to work through that trauma. She's living in a group home. She has no other relatives uh, to go and live with. And she gets a room all by herself because she does have night terrors still. Um, and people keep calling her lucky, lucky for surviving, lucky for getting her own room. And then this prestigious family out of the blue comes and takes her in. Um, and she is very reluctant to go. She is 17. She's almost kind of able to be on her own, um, but of course she goes with them. And when she's at the house, she realizes that there's a specific reason um, that they have asked uh, kind of to adopt her. And they have a daughter about her age, Agatha, and she hasn't spoken in years and they need help taking care of her. They think if she uh, has a companion her own age, maybe she will kind of have a breakthrough or enjoy, enjoy life more. And through that, now Margot's trying to figure out what has happened to Agatha, what is up with this house? There's something weird about it, especially when the sun comes back and has some questions about who she is and why she's living there. So if you want something very suspenseful that you're like, am I right, am I not? Like the whole time you just really have to devour it. This one is definitely for you. So that's the companion. Okay, The Personal Librarian by Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray. This is historical fiction based on the true story of Bella da Costa Green, who was J.P. Morgan's librarian. And more than just maintaining his collection, she negotiated the purchase of rare manuscripts and works of art. She mingled in the highest 
society to make the connection she needed to do that. And she eventually was instrumental in establishing the Morgan Library as a public institution. The amazing thing is she did all this while hiding the fact that she was African American and she's passing as white. Um, I was like on the edge of my seat worried, even though it's a true story and it all worked out for her, just worried that something would come, um, something would come out. And then, so this was co-written by a white and African-American author. And I saw an interview where it was so interesting. They developed an amazing working relationship and friendship over Zoom during the pandemic, which is when they wrote this book. Um, and they are hoping to work on more projects together because of their success with this one. My last book is Reborn in the USA by Roger Bennett. This is a biography. Um, Bennett is co-host on the show Men in Blazers. It's a soccer talk show. Here is Bennett romanticizes the United States while growing up in Liverpool, England. The gray days of the post Beatles Liverpool in the late 1970s and 80s. Bennett views John Hughes movies, 16 Candles and Ferris Bueller's Day Off, listening to Tracy Chapman and Bruce Springsteen and dreams of what life might be like in the United States. Once he's old enough, Bennett immigrates to the United States and recently began voting and gaining US citizenship. If you need to be reminded of why the United States is a beacon of hope for so many others, this is a great way to kind of get back in the mood of things. Highly recommend this book. Okay, my last book is The star Cross Sisters of Tuscany by Lori Nelson Spielman. Family curse, a long lost love, and a life-changing trip to Italy are the perfect ingredients that make up this charming read by Spielman. The star Cross Sisters of Tuscany is all about a curse brought upon the second-born daughters of the Fontana family, with Philomena Fontana cast a curse upon her sister more than 200 years ago. The curse claims that no second-born Fontana daughter will find lasting love. While Amelia denies the existence of such silly stories, she still finds herself boarding a flight to Italy with her sassy cousin Lucy and colorful almost 80 year old Aunt Poppy to help her aunt break the curse. This book reads as if it will be a predictable contemporary romance, but it is not and it makes it all the better. Uh, several times I thought I knew what was coming and the book surprised me. Um, read this book if you want a really good family saga filled with romance, new outlooks on life, and age-old familial secrets that might just change everything. I thoroughly enjoyed this one. That's The star Cross Sisters of Tuskegee by Lori Nelson Spielman. All right, my final book is Float Plan, and this is by Trish Dollar, and this contemporary novel totally broke my heart in the best way. This debut novel is about a young woman named Anna who is grieving the loss of her fiance, and she impetuously decides that, you know, to honor his memory, she is going to take his sailboat and kind of sail it around these gorgeous islands. Um, but here's the thing, Anna doesn't really know how to sail, so you can imagine she has um, some near misses, some potentially catastrophic accidents happen. Um, that really makes her question everything. What is she doing? Why did she decide to do this? You know, is she strong enough to do this? And she meets a man named Keen, and he is a sailor, and uh, he might just help her heal her heart and heal his too. Uh, this book made me laugh, it made me cry, and it's one of the best summer books that I've read in a long time. Read it outside with um, your favorite drink and tissues nearby. All right, Instructions for Dancing is by the well-loved author of Everything, Everything, and the sun is also a star, Nicola Yoon. Just like with her other titles, you most definitely will need tissues by the end of this one as well, but along the way, you will love it. I would say eighth grade and up for this one, and it's a romance with a hint of magical realism, which I really liked. Uh, so Evie um, is over-believing in love. Uh, she caught her father having an affair on her mother, and she's just done with it. Um, she's getting rid of all of her romance books. That was her favorite. And when she's donating them, she runs into this woman she's never seen before. And she gives her a book called Instructions for Dancing. And she's like, you look like you need this, has this interesting conversation. And then it's like, she's gone. And next thing she knows, she is flipping through the book. She's noticing that when she sees strangers kiss, she sees their whole love story, like 
from when they met through usually a breakup. Some of them, it's different. Uh, and she doesn't know what is happening. Uh, she notices inside the book, there's a studio listed. And when she arrives, she kind of gets wrapped up in the dance lessons and gets partnered with this uh, guy named X. And from there, she's not sure what to do. She's trying to figure out what to do about her feelings for about her father. Um, she's fighting her feelings for love. And it's just an awesome, interesting twist of a story, trying to figure out why she could see these love stories um, that, that other people have. Um, so if you want something that has a lot to it, as Nicolene does, uh, that's Instructions for Dancing. Thank you, everyone. That You guys all did great. Um, again, I will send out the, that list of books to participants after um, our program is over. And if you did like this book party, our next one is going to be in October. It's not published um, on the website yet under events, but it will be um, come September 1st. So keep an eye on that um, and join us for another one. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or email me back after I send out the list. But again, thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Book Tuckers. You guys did great.